Hi there, viewers. Today, I'm joining a conversation with author James Egan, the author of Inner World, a satire. It's a pleasure to have James featured on the show. How are you doing, James? Uh, all together, I'm doing fine. How about yourself? Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So, James, could you tell us about your book, Inner World, a satire? How does this book come about? What inspired you to write Inner World? I started out with a title. Sometimes that's what happens. I, you know, I'll just think of a title. Mm. And I started writing a comedy. And uh, my agent didn't really like the title. But I kept it for one of the um, uh, chapters. Uh, but we both felt that Inner World was a more appropriate title because it's concise. It's, you know, one word. And I like fantasy and I like science fiction, but I also mm. like comedy. I, I do satires on these uh, genres. They're my favorite, so they're warm satires. They're broad. They're easily mm. accessible. They're family friendly. It's, it's that kind of thing. Well, that's quite and amazing. Uh, thank you. Inner world was um, the idea that we have, um, you know, it's kind of, even though it's a fantasy, it's a bit of a science fiction because we talk about multiple universes and that, you know, all these different planes are on different vibrations. And you can have an, two existing universes in one space. Mm -hmm. Other other place exists so that's kind of how i set it up so it's an alternate universe within the center of our world so there's yeah. a lot of jules Verne that i'm putting in there and some c.s lewis and uh a little bit of ray bradbury all my influences uh to make a comedy about a, a young boy who can save not only our world we live in, but inner world where he is sent to by uh, sort of an angelic figure mm -hmm. to um, to finish out a prophecy oh. and in doing so, save both both worlds. And um, we learn a lot about our hero. He's a typical kid. He's got a little bit of trouble with digestion. Mm. <laughs> Part of the humor every hero in a fantasy has an achilles heel oh. so in this case it's his uh he needs to use the bathroom more often than <laughs> and uh when he gets oh. to uh, this fantasy world it all changes he starts to change he starts to grow up really fast mm. mature far too fast in fact in a deadly speed he's aging quickly and he only has a week to finish his assignment that's been given to him before he dies. Oh. So the topic is basically when God gives you something to do in your life, do it. Don't waste your time. Because mm. it'll go to somebody else. And mm. uh, he wants us to do what he has called us to do, what he has made us to do. And that's sort of the spiritual angle i put on it that and the fact that this young man is not quite sure that this, this is all really happening to him mm. he's not he's not quite sure that he's having a hallucination but he decides regardless to believe in it and act on faith mm. wow that sounds quite intriguing to me i love the sound of in a word a satire sounds quite amazing now, James, I also see that you have another book titled Tales of the Astral Force. For readers yeah, who haven't... Is, yeah. This is the first, first edition. We're going to do a different edition and make it a little bit more attached. Mm. For, so it can be a series of stories. So yeah. you basically follow my favorite genres through different types of stories. So right now it's fantasy. Then it will be science fiction or really space opera then there'll be a superhero one there'll be a haunted house one well wow. and then there'll be a christmas one 
and all comedies, mm. and they we all have a Christian worldview. Mm. That's amazing. And I'd love to ask you, for readers who haven't read the book yet, and without giving much information away, could you have a sneak of what we'd expect picking up Tales of the Astro Force? Yeah, with Tales of the Astro Force, you're going to have a hero who's really a coward. And um, he thinks he's all things to all women, but he's not. So he's oh. very egotistical. So he's mm -hmm. quite the opposite of what a hero would be. And that's where the satire comes in. Because back in the old days when they would make science fiction movie serials, the hero was always very strong and, and sure of himself. It's kind of sexist. So I turned it on its head. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. And I think you have you have an admiration towards writing comic novels, right? How do you come yeah. about writing comic novels? Because most of it, if talking so far, are satire, comics, and all of that. Well, what happens is, uh, you know, I did a lot of theater, professional theater, most of my adult life. I oh. studied it and um, graduated with a degree in it as I was working. And I started working in a theater which specifically did spoofs and satires. So it was a kind of inbred in me to, to work in comedy. I also took classes. Mm. And, um, the interesting thing about comedy is if you get the joke, then you pretty much get the idea what the author or player is trying to say. If you don't get the joke, you might be offended. Wow. And, so that's what that's the danger with satire because it can sound very real. Like I, you know, if you were to pick up Inner World and read it, and not think of it as a satire, you'd think of it as a very fun adventure fantasy. Mm -hmm. But if you pick up Astro Force and think it's a science fiction uh, space opera, it's got a lot of jokes and um, a lot of very strange characters that none of them are are perfect you know they all have problems and they have to work it out together with each other to save the universe it's another one of those dire uh, tropes in those kinds of stories and so comedy seems for me to be easily accessible uh, i've done a lot of it on the stage and i've written a lot of it i've written jokes i've done stand-up oh. yeah yeah so kind of a history with me. It's amazing to know. That's pretty much amazing to know. And now I'd love to ask you, James, you know, as authors, we all have different ways of reacting to feedbacks and criticism of our works. I'm curious to know your opinion about criticism. How do you react to negative criticisms of your book, if you've ever had one in time past? I've had uh, negative criticisms about some of my performances. Um, but I've never really had anything negative about what I've written because it's fairly new. So I'm sure it'll come. But uh, Lawrence Olivier said uh, a long time ago, and I'm paraphrasing it, but um, if you know him, he was considered the best actor of his day. And he would say to people, don't ever listen to the uh, bad criticism. And of course, they'd nod and say, oh, that's nice. And then he'd say, don't listen to the good criticism either. Because critics, they're to criticize. And if they're good critics, they will give you something to work on that can maybe help you next time you're working. If they're bad critics, and a lot of them are, what they say means nothing. It's what does the audience want? What does your reader want? If your reader likes what you're doing, don't stop. Oh. Despite what a critic might say. And to critique the kind of work I do is very hard. It's it's also hard to edit because you don't necessarily follow the Chicago manual of style when you're mm -hmm. doing comedy because you might want to break up a sentence a certain way uh, for impact, for comedic impact. Mm -hmm. Douglas Adams did that all the time. And um, he was very funny. He also worked for Monty Python for a little while. Also, Ray Bradbury also broke a lot of rules. And he has a chapter in Dandelion Wine where it's, it's just a page and it just, and it's a chapter. 
And it says, nothing really important happened that day. That's it. That's one chapter in one of his books. But he's Ray Bradbury, you know, and everybody's respect for him is such that he can he can do that. And his stuff is really amazing. Mm. I highly recommend reading Dandelion Wine. Oh, that's amazing. I love your opinion about criticism and how you handle it. And I also see, James, that you have another book titled The Making of Justus Lament another short place. I never knew you were a playwright. Could you tell us a bit about Justus Lamed, another short place? Yeah. I um, started uh, working as a playwright in 93 uh, for a theater company I was already involved in as an actor. And they hired me to do lyrics for a musical version of Treasure Island. Oh. And that was like the first time I was actually going to be writing musical lyrics instead of jokes. Oh. And uh, and that uh, that was an, a great experience. And then from there, um, I they liked what I did with a children's show that was original called Elves. Um, it eventually became a musical. I brought in another composer. But it was originally just a straight comedy for kids. And it did very well. Mm. And in fact, it did so well that the artistic director hired me to write an adaptation of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. So that is still going on every Christmas in Thousand Oaks, California, is, is this one I wrote. And a lot of times I'm in it. I get to be in it. Um, and hopefully this year I'll be able to do that. But um, your question was uh, about Justice Lament. So what happened... The church I go to is pretty big, lots of people. It's um, it's integrated. It's uh, got men and women from all different kinds of backgrounds, politically and uh, uh, racially and uh, emotionally and uh, levels of maturity in Christianity. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things that they have is a really good youth group. They have a tremendous program for their youth. And so a lot of times I would be asked to write a skit for one of their Sunday school classes or one of their camps. And um, I would write it out you know, based on what they gave me as far as the material would go. Mm -hmm. And they'd perform it. They'd go all out. They'd get costumes and makeup and set pieces. And they did, just did this tremendous work. And I would go sit and watch this and be just flabbergasted at, at all the um, attention that they put into the artistry, which oh. I really appreciate with that oh. church. They've really been very, very good on mm. trying to raise the bar so that what is seen is seen as being professional oh. uh, in its um, quality. So I decided then, well, I don't have a book out yet. Why don't I put these skits together that I've written and publish a book? And uh, so I at least have some street cred, published playwright, a resident playwright of a, a theater company. And also I work as a playwright at my church and as an actor and as a co-director. Oh. So, um, so those were fun. And they happened over a period of several years. And then I put everything together, uh, 2007, I think. Ooh. And I came out with it. And um, this is also going to get a revision because I need to cite some sources. Oh, wow, that's a b great cover. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Just we'll have a learn. different one. I'll be, I'll be with a different publisher. But yeah, I like it. It's got a sort of a... Mm, I like it as well. Look to it like a th at a theater. So... Mm. Uh, so that'll be fun. And so I'm with uh, um, uh, The Guardian right now, and I'm working with them. We, we got a three-book deal, and uh, uh, the first one, of course, is Inner World. That is available to download from Amazon on Kindle, and I think you can get it on uh, Apple Books oh. for Mac, and you can get it in hardcover at barnesandnoble.com. Oh. But we haven't had a book launch yet. But when we have that, then it'll be available in paperback and uh, other forms and other different stores. 
right now I've got some friends in the uh, Christian music industry that um, are waiting for their copies. And so I have a few copies here to sign and send out on Monday. And uh, so I don't know when this will air, but that'll be Monday. Let's see, today's the uh, second. So that'll be July 3rd that those will go mm. out. And then I'll have a couple more coming in that I have to sign and send out. But that, that's out to see it. They get to give you some, uh, you know, a little bit of background, uh, mm. their okay. own uh, likes and desires of those kinds of books, and uh, mm. a little bit of feedback. Uh, now, for inner world, I for um, a few, or actually a couple of years, I had it up on Ink It as a contest, and I got a lot of reviews, and those reviews were from readers. Oh. And so they were very important um, because that's really who you're trying to, to reach are your readers. So on the back of the, um, you won't be able to see this too well, I don't think, but on the back of the cover mm. are all, the, not all of them, but a lot of the reviews that came oh, through. Oh, beautiful. And um, so, and then let's see on the inside is a, a bio of me. And the acknowledgments, and um, it also mentions all the work I do in theater and, and some of the stuff I've done in film. And, and mm. being with um, Marnie Lynn Fields right now on uh, a movie she wrote about her mother. Her mother had dementia, and it's um, it's a moving story. It has a pretty powerful ending. Mm. And I'm working as an executive producer, but she also auditioned me. So I'm keeping the beard, keeping the long hair because I'll be playing as uh, oh. a Oh, wow. That's amazing to know. And I hope that goes well. <laughs> I do too, because it's a, you know, it's an important topic. Mm. We really need to understand what happens when people go start to go through mm. that. Um, that it's not, it's not something to be made fun of or to mm. just brush aside, but that person's really ill and they need help. Mm. There's nothing, nothing more helpful than prayer. So, yeah. To keep in prayer. Yeah, that's great to know. Now, James, let's talk about challenges. I'm curious to know if you experience any challenges while writing your books. If there is any, could you share with us what challenge it is? And now you ultimately overcame it. You know, it's interesting because as an actor, you always have to create a challenge for your character if it isn't obvious in the, in the script. Because uh, that's how you build an inner life. That's what they call it. And um, you also do that with your characters in your books. You have challenges that they have to overcome in order to for you to have a story, whether it's a mm -hmm. comedy or an adventure or a tragedy, no matter what. There's something that the character wants and or needs, and there's something in their way of getting it. Well, that's the way it is in life. So here's a challenge for me. How do I get in a world published? I've been working on it for years. Mm. Well, it didn't go where I wanted it to go. My agent submitted it to a lot of different publishers. Finally, he suggested that maybe I should try it as an indie author. Mm -hmm. And that's when I went to The Guardian, and we are doing very well together. We're working very well together. Uh, it wasn't as expensive as it would have been with somebody else. And, um, in fact, the people I was with before, this is, this is a tremendous difference. Um, mm -hmm. I get illustrations. I get better covers. I get better coverage. I get all kinds of advertisements with my book deal. And so I went... Um, so that was the challenge. How do I get this out there? Can I afford it? And mm. all of that. And so working it out with um, uh, the, the gentleman I work with directly with The Guardian, we've been able to come up with some nice prices. And um, they've been doing some really good work designing a website for me. And um, soon I'll be, well, my voice is better. I'll be doing the audio recording of the wow. so you get the audio. Amazing. And, I had a lot of radio experience, so mm. I'll have that to do, uh, which I want to do. I want to do the reading of it. Saves them money. They don't have to pay anybody. And um, 
Yeah. And I get a I get I get the free service as well. I don't have to pay anybody. I do the work. It's really nice. <laughs> yeah. And then so that um audiobook should probably be ready next year sometime. Oh. That's beautiful to know. That's quite amazing to know. Now I also love to ask you, James, apart from inner world and tales of the astral force, do you have any other works you've altered or maybe currently working on? Yes, I'm working on uh, a, uh, and this is taking me a long time. It started out as a play. It's in the Justice Lament book as a play, but it's going to be a, hopefully a larger novel than what I've done in the past. But it's a, it's, again, it's a satire. It takes place in the same little town, and it's a superhero story. It's called Jet Powers and His Amazing Space Badger. Mm. And so already there's comedy in the title. Uh, in fact, the the badger makes appearances in every story. Just a little cameo every now and then. He'll he'll pop up. So there's a reason why, and you'll you'll find out when you read his story. And um, and so I'm working on that. And uh, I got a lot done, but it's still got to be pieced together. I started the haunted house one as a screenplay, and I found that the dialogue was so funny. I thought, well, you know, I got to make it a comedy. So mm. I'm going to make it a book. And then the um, the other one is my uh, uh, play I told you about that um, I did for the company, and it's called Elves, and it's a Christmas comedy, and um, it's very funny, and that's that's going to be the other one, and it's it's in play form right now, but it'll be novel form when when it's ready to go. So there should be I think five altogether, mm -hmm. and and then if you. You can read them out of order. They don't have to be read in or any kind of order. Oh. But if you wanted to, elves would be first because that's the turn of the last century from uh, 1800 to 1900. And then um, Jeb Powers and his amazing space badger would be uh, next because that's World War II. And then um, the haunted house one, which right now is called Heretic House, would be contemporary. Mm. An inner world would be contemporary. And then Tales of the Astro Forces and the Distant Future. Oh. oh, that's quite lovely to know. And now I'd love to ask you, James, is there anything that you'd love to share with the viewers about your books that we couldn't mention in this interview? I would love the viewers to know. Maybe one or two things. Well, um, Tales of the Astro Force was originally going to be a musical. In fact, it was. It was called mm. Jack and Bill on Planet 10. We did it live in a Borders bookstore along with a book signing. We did very well. Wow. Uh, the music is really good. It's really good rock and roll music. And uh, my uh, composer's name is Rick Pratt. He's also a director. He's directed theater. He's directed film. And he's a musician. And we're very good friends. We go all the way back to those days. I told you about working at this melodrama comedy mm. theater and we crack each other up you know we have the same similar sense of humor so he wanted to do it and so he wrote the music i wrote most of the lyrics and whatever i couldn't he filled in and it turned out to be really really neat so that's something that's unusual that a book is being based on a musical instead of the other way around mm. you know, you know, a play is based on a book already written. Um, and this will have more adult things in it than the other books because of the character. The main character's flaws are something that need to be addressed. And mm. that is uh, narcissism should not be anywhere near a Christian way of living. They should not be thinking of themselves they should be thinking of others first and he's a huge narcissist which also you know brings in the comedy because writing dumb people is pretty fun <laughs> writing dumb people is really fun <laughs> that's funny it is. <laughs> it is it's a lot of fun <laughs> so uh so yeah the play did well and we sold out our books so um so yeah, we and I got a really good review on Amazon for the book, and um, uh, a lot of 
you know, you get a lot of praise from your family and friends yeah. and to realize, okay, these are my family and this is my friends, but my family and friends are very well versed in the arts. Every one of them, mm. you know, they're actors or they're musicians or they're, they do other kinds of artwork. Uh, my mom has a hobby um, where she builds and designs dresses for dolls. And uh, is quite fantastic at it. She also paints, oh, and uh, we have some of her stuff hanging on the wall. And there's more mm. put up. And then uh, and my oldest sisters, they both had, they both could draw. They were like my dad; they could draw, and they can sing. I'd also um, love to ask you, James, as a published author, what sort of advice do you have for other writers? Who are still struggling with publishing a book like yours? What did you tell people in this category? Well, in this situation, it was hard to find a publisher that saw that what I was writing was not just a children's story, but was a comedy. So you really need to be very specific when you're using an agency uh, that's going to send you out to big publishers mm -hmm. what exactly it is that you are writing and to whom you're writing. And why? So if that's not clear, uh, you could it could end up in the wrong department, and you won't hear from them again. Mm. So um, be very precise with your description of your book, and and why, and to who you're you're selling it to, why you're doing it. Uh, being a Christian writer, wanting to be involved in um, the what you would call um, the faith based entertainment um there's not really a niche for this kind of comedy yet mm. but i think it's going to be there uh right now things are serious although i don't know i really did like um uh, the one that thor ramsey just did uh christopher shawnshaw directed um church people I thought it was hilarious oh and i think that that's a, a really good uh, indication that there's a level of excellence that is trying to be reached even in comedy mm. uh, for um, people who are believers but also who may not be believers but will find oh i know who those people are i recognize that kind of a christian mm. uh, makes sense to me <laughs> uh. <laughs> so yeah i think the, my advice would be be very specific and don't be afraid to go indie just you know it's going to cost you money but it's yeah. going to cost you money anyway. Mm. No matter what, you're still going to have to pay for a lot of the stuff that that a, a a traditional publisher is going to want you to pay for: extra advertising, uh, changes in text or in the in the cover. Mm. Um, nothing's free. So, uh, uh, with with being an independent, I'm in control of the material. I yeah. don't want to I don't want to. So. That helps a great deal, but it also takes an awful lot of time. So be patient. Mm. And when you're in my situation where, you know, you can't do much, uh, patience is a virtue. And um, I spend a lot of my time watching other similar uh, oh, programs yes. to kind of keep me in the funny mood and also in the, in the genre I'm working in. So I'm going to be doing my um, rewrites of, astroforce really soon because they've already the publisher has already picked it up to do the formatting so mm. when they're done with that then i go in and i make my changes and yeah some of it will be pretty strong and then some of it won't have to be done at all yeah that's great thank you so much for your advice and i'm hopeful that viewers including myself would love to utilize it so james on what platform can your book be purchased in case we have interested viewers who would love to get a copy? Where can they get a copy? Okay, so Amazon for uh, downloads for Kindle. Okay. Barnesandnoble.com for hardcover. Yeah. Right. The, the website's not ready yet. Okay. That's great. And I've left a link in the description part of this interview where viewers can get a copy directly on Amazon and on Barnes & Nobles. So thank you so much, James, for accepting the invitation to be featured on P English Literature. It's a pleasure having you on the show. I like listening to you. I like hearing who you have. I enjoy this. It's wonderful. Thank you for having me.
Yeah, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Very lovely. Well, I'm glad we were able to get through that question bubble. And uh, God bless you with everything you do.